This series that we've engaged in for the last, this will be week five here of Reformation 500, has been a, a tremendous blessing in my life. I mean, I, I hope you're having as much of a good time as I am. This has been just a thrill to do. I, I don't think I've ever preached a series where I've received such overwhelmingly positive feedback from a whole variety of individuals at our church. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience, and, and I'm having a great time. I, I'll, I'll be sad when it's over. Next week will be the last Sunday in Reformation 500, but it's just been such a, an incredible joy. I wanted to take a second before diving into the next sola, solus Christus, uh, to just address a, a, a common question, something that I think is worthy of remark, which is why study the Reformation to begin with? Why, why, why enter into this study? There's three things that have really stirred my heart towards this study, and I just wanted to briefly bring them out this morning. Morning. One reason is this. Why enter into this study? First of all, for the sake of understanding our place in the story of Christianity. I really think that's actually been one of the greatest benefits of this study so far. I think most evangelicals understand that the Reformation was important, that something big happened then, something significant, and yet most evangelicals at the same time really don't know what it was or what is the difference here between Catholicism and Protestantism. And this has been a great opportunity for us to kind of figure out where do we fit into this whole story of Christianity. Christianity. This is a, a massive oversimplification here. It's almost criminal, but I think it will be at least a little bit helpful to us. If you think of the grand story of Christianity, you really have to start in 1054 with a great schism. 1054, the great schism separated Roman Catholicism from Eastern Orthodoxy. Some people call it Greek Orthodoxy or Russian Orthodoxy. But in 1054, a great split happened within Christendom. And then in 1517, the season that we're studying, we have the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther on October 31st, 1517, nailing the 95 Theses to the castle door in Wittenberg. Out of the Protestant Reformation, three different branches emerged. There was Lutheranism, the Reformed, and the Anabaptists. Again, this is a massive oversimplification, but by and large, where we fit today as evangelicals is something of a combination between Reformed and Anabaptists in 2017. Lutheranism still exists today. I have good friends that are Lutheran uh, pastors, uh, but it really is kind of its own separate thing, whereas the Reformed and Anabaptist kind of mingled, and there's all kinds of denominations and 500 more years of history. But I think that's one of the, the first and really the greatest benefits of a story, study of the Reformation is understanding our place in the story of Christianity. Th these are our people. This is where we belong right here. A second reason to enter into this study is for the sake of apologetics. For the sake of apologetics. Uh, the word apologetics means the defense of the faith. And a study of the Reformation is an invitation into apologetics. You see, there has never been, in 500 years, there has never been so much pressure put upon the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as there is today to make peace with Rome. Popular Christian media like Christianity Today simply take it for granted that the Roman Catholic Church shares a common faith with evangelicals, which is not true. Truthfully, due to our lack of attention to these matters, many believers in churches today have absolutely no idea that there is a real substantive difference between biblical Christianity and Roman Catholicism. And that's exacerbated by the fact that while that American Catholicism, while it holds to the same beliefs and doctrines as every other national expression of Catholicism, the way that the American Catholic Church lives out those beliefs is much different than in any other part of the world. American Catholicism is very much the outlier. It is very much unique when you think of Catholicism across the world. For example, in the town of Animas Trajano, which is just outside of Oaxaca City in Mexico, where Josh and Emily, uh, Josh and Emily Merchant minister, every year on Good Friday, the local Catholic church elects a man to become Jesus for the day. He is led through the town, crucified, 
and actually prayed to. You see, what you have to understand is that the American experience of the Roman Catholic Church is highly unusual when you consider the global experience of over a billion Catholics. The beliefs are the same, the doctrines are the same, the catechism is the same, that's their doctrinal statement. But in America, the Roman Church has found a way to make itself more palatable to everyday people. And so in large part, what I hope to accomplish in this series is just to make you aware of that. Uh, to, in a sense, put you on the defense, to put you on guard, and to expose the heretical and blasphemous teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. You know, I love what Spurgeon said in regard to this conversation. Spurgeon said, he said, war, war, peace there cannot be. The Roman Catholic Church cannot have peace with us. We cannot have peace with her. She hates the true church, and we can only say that the hatred is reciprocated. Their doctrine we would destroy from the face of the earth as the doctrine of devils. And so defense is another good reason. And the third is for the sake of love. I think this is important, especially in a series of polemical sermons like we're doing now. I mean, these are, these are kind of wake you up and, you know, shake your boots sermons that we've been preaching, and intentionally so, absolutely intentionally so. But I think it's important to point out that the reason, the reason to preach these kind of sermons, the reason to, to proclaim this kind of truth is because it's the most loving thing that we could do. The most hateful thing we could do would be to be quiet and just to let people continue racing to hell in a false system that can never save and enslaves and ensnares them. The most loving thing we could do is to speak the truth. It, it is not that we despise or hate our Catholic neighbors or even that we think that they are any less intelligent than we are, not on any level whatsoever. The truth is, if it were not for the grace of God, we would be lost ourselves. But the truth is also that they are lost and trapped in an apostate system, and many, if not most of them, have no idea how lost and trapped they really are. And so for the sake of love, we have a responsibility, a responsibility to, to evangelize, to, to enter into meaningful and gracious conversations with our Catholic neighbors and, and to present the, the glorious and beautiful truths that were rediscovered in the Reformation. We said this earlier, but it does bear repeating. When we talk about Roman Catholicism, we're talking about a system of religion, a system that is founded on the catechism, their doctrinal statement. And that's worthy of opening up and critiquing and examining in detail. But when you're talking about individual Catholic people, that's different. Like, truth is, we don't really know all of what an individual Catholic person believes. To examine the system, we go to the catechism. To talk to an individual, we enter into gracious and meaningful and winsome conversations. Two things that are both dreadfully important and dreadfully needed, too. Now, the means by which we've taken on this study is by examining what are known as the five solas of the Reformation, the five onlys, five, uh, five convictions that roared forth from the Reformers and which continue to reverberate even today, 500 years later. Now, taken together, these five solas answer two fundamental questions. One, how can a man be saved? And two, what does it mean to be Protestant? Well, this morning what I want to do is to examine the fourth of these solas and to consider the doctrine of solus Christus, the doctrine of Christ alone. On October 10th of 1520, a messenger rode into the city of Wittenberg with a message from the Pope himself. It's what's called a papal bull. And this particular bull had been issued by Pope Leo X in June of 1520, but it took several months to get to Wittenberg, some 800 miles away. The name of the bull was Exerge Domine, and in this bull, the Pope outlined 41 errors in Luther's 95 Theses and in his other writings. 
And the bowl began with these very famous words. It said, Arise, O Lord, and judge thy cause. A wild boar has invaded thy vineyard. Arise, O Peter, and consider the case of the Holy Roman Church, the mother of all churches, consecrated by thy blood. Arise, O Paul. And then it proceeded to lay out the charges against Martin Luther and to give him 60 days in order to recant of his teachings. Now, what, what you have to understand, this is so foreign to evangelicals, it bears some explanation. What you have to understand is that in issuing this bull, the Pope was directly threatening Martin Luther's, not just his life, although he was threatening his very life, the Pope could have him killed, he was actually threatening his eternal life, his salvation. Because remember, according to Rome, the Pope has the ability to remove a person's salvation, to withhold Christ from them, if he sees fit. And so that's what was on the table for Luther. Now, Luther, never one to mince words, quickly responded in a pamphlet called the Against the Execrable Bull of Antichrist. Well, that's, that's a title, isn't it? I mean, that'll get your blood boiling. This is what a part of what he said. He said, with my whole heart, I dissent from the damnation of this bull, that I curse and execrate it as a sacrilege and blasphemy of Christ, God's Son and our Lord. This be my recantation. So then, you impious and insensate papists, this bull is the sum of all impiety, blasphemy, ignorance, impudence, hypocrisy, lying. In a word, it is Satan and his Antichrist. Is anybody unclear on what he thought of that? <laughs> Later, Luther wrote, Previously, I said the Pope is the vicar of Christ. When he was a monk, I recant. Now I say the Pope is the adversary of Christ and the apostle of the devil. On December 10th of 1520, Luther took a copy of that papal decree out into the center of Wittenberg and burned it as a public demonstration of his resolve. The Pope then responded with another papal bull titled Decet Romanum Pontificum on January 3rd, 1521, which officially excommunicated Luther, removing his salvation and removing his civil rights and protections, actually. And again, what you, what you have to get, this is so foreign to us, what you have to get is that this is not just an academic debate. This is not just the Luther and the Pope who have two opposing views. Luther grew up his whole life knowing that the Pope, as the keeper of the keys, has the ability to grant forgiveness and to withhold forgiveness, to, to literally cast someone out of the kingdom of heaven. And when the Pope excommunicated Luther, he was asserting his right, according to Rome, to withhold forgiveness, to, to withhold Christ from Luther and to cast him into hell itself. That's what was on the table. Well, to this blasphemous assertion that any one man would hold that kind of authority, Luther and the Reformers responded back with the doctrine of solus Christus, that it is Christ and it is Christ alone who secures our salvation, and it is Christ and it is Christ alone who sustains our salvation. You know, we, we have, as evangelicals, we have such a wonderful inheritance, do we not? We have such a wonderful theological inheritance. It, it's probably never even crossed your mind that anyone but Christ could save you. It, the, the notion probably has never even occurred to you that that could be the case. And I would just point out again that that is thanks to Luther and the reformers who rediscovered the gospel, and specifically this morning, who rediscovered the doctrine of solus Christus. First of all, that Christ and Christ alone secures our 
salvation. Now, the means by which Christ secures our salvation is redemption and imputation. We covered these briefly last week. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is the doctrine of imputation, that, that in the gospel, what Christ offers us is not only the forgiveness of sins, which he took upon himself, but what he offers us is his own perfect righteousness. He not only fills up all of what is lacking, but he gives us an overabundance of righteousness that we might become the children of God. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says this, Christ entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. What Christ secured in his sacrifice on Calvary, in his death, burial, and resurrection, secured an eternal redemption. Romans 5, 8, and 9, but God shows his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Colossians 1, 19 and 20, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Do you see this? Do you see the emphasis, the whole theme, the movement of the New Testament is that it is Christ and only Christ that, is, that saved us. It is by his blood. It is by his sacrifice, by his redemption, by his death, burial, and resurrection with nothing else added that we are made the children of God. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one else. There is no one else. It is only through me. You see, what we get in the gospel, what we get in the gospel is not just salvation. It's not just having our sins forgiven and the righteousness of Christ applied to us as incredible and beautiful as that is. What we get in the gospel is Christ. We actually receive and feed upon Christ in the gospel. And no one but Christ can make that possible. The difference between that, between the scripture's description of Christ alone, and the Roman Catholic Church's understanding of salvation could not be more different. They could not be more diametrically opposed to one another. First of all, Rome denies that we are saved solely on the basis of Christ's finished work. Rome denies that we are saved solely on the basis of Christ, Christ's finished work. Council of Trent in session seven or session six, Canon eleven said this: If anyone says that men are justified either by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ alone, solus Christus, or by the remission of sins alone, to the exclusion of the grace and love that is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and is inherent in them, or even that the grace by which we are justified is only the favor of God, then let him be anathema. Let him be damned. If anyone claims that it is Christ that Christ's sacrifice alone was sufficient to save, let him be damned. The Roman Catholic Church denies that Christ's sacrifice alone is enough. And secondly, Rome affirms that in order for a person to be saved, he must submit to and obey the Pope and the Roman Church church. This is not an auxiliary point of doctrine for Rome. This is not something kind of extra on the side. It is inherent. It is necessary. It is required of one in order to be saved. 
1299, Pope Boniface VIII declared, it is altogether necessary to salvation for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. And again, I would remind you that when a pope says that, he's not just airing, it's, it's not like he's just getting on Twitter and writing a few thoughts out, as we see so often nowadays. This is ex cathedra, okay? This has even greater authority than the Bible itself in the Roman system. He says, it is altogether necessary, every human creature, to be subject to the pontiff. Pope Pius XI said this, he said, the Catholic Church alone is keeping the true worship. This is the font of truth, this is the house of faith, this is the temple of God. If any man enter not here, or if any man go forth from it, he is a stranger to the hope of life and salvation. Furthermore, in this one church of Christ, no man can be or remain who does not accept, recognize, and obey the authority and supremacy of Peter and his legitimate successors, the Pope. You cannot be saved if you don't obey the Pope. Well, in light of these blasphemous claims, I don't use that word lightly. I think today, almost more than any of the other days, we are seeing the blasphemous nature of the Roman Catholic Church. It's not hard to understand why Luther wrote the following. Luther wrote, the Pope is the very Antichrist himself who has exalted himself above and opposed himself against Christ because he will not permit Christians to be saved. He said, therefore, just as little as we can worship the devil himself as Lord and God, we can endure his apostle, the Pope. For to lie and to kill and destroy a body and soul eternally, that is wherein his papal government really consists. Now, as, as powerful as, as that is, because that's a powerful statement, no one has countered Rome's claim better than the Apostle Paul himself in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, 6, Paul writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be damned. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be damned damned. Where do we go to find the gospel? We go to the pages of the New Testament. Where did the reformers go? To the pages of the New Testament. You know what they found there? That you don't have to obey the Pope to be saved. All that is necessary for salvation is Christ. And what we receive in salvation is Christ and Christ alone. The error of the Galatians, the Galatian heresy, was that a group known as the Judaizers had come into this church that Paul had planted and had taught the church that not only did they need to believe in Jesus, but they also needed to keep the law. They needed to add good works. They needed to add some things unto their salvation so that they could really be saved. And the heresy of Rome is the exact same heresy of the Judaizers. It's Jesus plus something. Jesus plus obedience to the Pope. Jesus plus works of penance. Jesus plus indulgences. But if you have to add anything to Christ, then you've denied the gospel, and you've diminished the glory of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, because it's just no longer true that Jesus paid it all. It's just Jesus paid a lot, and you need to make up the difference. That's not the gospel. That's not good news, friends. That is not good news. It is Christ and Christ alone who secures our salvation. Not the Pope, not the church, but Christ 
We come into the kingdom of heaven one at a time in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, not only does the doctrine of solus Christus teach us that Christ alone secures our salvation, but further, it guarantees us that Christ alone sustains our salvation. Christ secures our salvation, and Christ sustains our salvation. I think the years between 1527 and 1528 were probably some of the hardest years that Luther ever faced in his life. They were years of terrific darkness and sorrow in Luther's life. In August of 1527, a disciple of Luther was martyred by the Catholic Church. In the fall of 1527, a plague descended upon Wittenberg, causing many of Luther's friends and church members, even his own son, to become deathly ill. And while everyone else was fleeing the city, Luther stayed to minister to the sick and dying. In December of 1527, Luther's wife Katie bore him a little girl that they named Elizabeth. But sadly, Elizabeth was born, and she was very sickly from the outset. And in May of 1528, after six months of pleading with the Lord for her life, Elizabeth finally succumbed and passed away, just six months into her young life. And it was in the midst of all of these trials and even in other sorrows that Luther just lost himself in the 46th Psalm. And you're familiar with Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And it was out of his time in this Psalm that Luther wrote the following words, A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Later he wrote, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. In later years when Luther and the Reformers in Wittenberg would be given to despondency when the whole world would crash in around them. His friends would gather together and say, Brothers, let us sing the 46th. And they would sing, A mighty fortress is our God. You see, Luther understood that since it was Christ alone who saved him, this same Christ was more than capable of sustaining him through whatever sorrows might come. His way. Can I ask you a question this morning? Do you believe that too? You know, maybe you've come into this place, and what I've described in Luther's life in those years sounds awfully familiar to what you're going through in your own life. Your own sorrows and losses and uncertainties and just fear. I, I think Solus Christus has something to say to you. I think Luther has something to say to you. If Christ's death was enough to save you, then friend, you need have no fear. His death, burial, and resurrection are more than enough to sustain you. He will carry you. He will hold you fast through whatever sorrows may come. You can trust him. That's what carried Luther through. That's what carried the Reformation forward. Christ alone was enough. They didn't need anything else. If they had Christ, they had everything. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 25 says this, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Christ, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Isn't that a fascinating passage? It's not, it's not that Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, it's not that his sacrifice was enough to start your salvation, as Rome teaches. No. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost. 
From beginning to end, our salvation is accomplished through Christ. And even when we sin, it says this, he always lives to make intercession for them. Even when we sin, Christ continues to intercede with the Father and sustain our salvation. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Have you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him as your Lord and Savior? If so, friends, that is true of you. There is now and there will never be any condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Now, this this confidence in Christ and Christ alone stands in utter and stark contrast to the Roman church, and especially to the Roman church's blasphemous teaching about the Virgin Mary. If you were to travel to Madrid, Spain, and visit the Prado Museum in Madrid, Spain, you would find a portrait there by a man named Diego Velazquez from 1636 titled The Coronation of the Virgin. I can't think of a better description or a better illustration of the blasphemous doctrine of the Virgin Mary than this picture itself. And if you'll look at it, what you'll notice is the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And do you see what they're doing in this picture? They are actually placing a crown upon Mary's head declaring her to be the queen of heaven itself. Practically speaking, Mary functions as the fourth member of the Trinity in Roman Catholicism. Practically speaking, that's how she is treated. Now, you may be wondering, how in the world could that have happened? If you read the biblical accounts, there really is very little information about Mary to begin with. It doesn't actually say all that much about her. So how did we end up in this wretched place of exalting her so high up into the heavenlies? How could such false teaching infiltrate the church and be tolerated in a supposedly Christian church? And a little bit of historical perspective will help with that. In 380 AD, the Roman Emperor Theodosius converted the entire Roman Empire. In 380 AD, that was one big empire. In 380 AD, the Roman Emperor Theodosius converted the entire Roman Empire from paganism, the worship of many different gods, to Christianity, the worship of the one true God. The problem with that was that, as Calvin said, the whole nation got baptized, but very few people got converted. Uh, They hadn't been born, again, because that's not how Christianity works, right? You can't just nationally declare, we're all Christians now, get over it. That's not how Christianity works. And so what ended up happening uh, was a religion was created that was Christian, but which incorporated many different aspects of their previous lives and their paganism, especially the worship of many gods. Uh, The people brought in their pagan practices into Christendom. They used to pray to, venerate, bow down, light candles for a host of pagan Greco-Roman deities. And so they simply exchanged the pantheon of Greco-Roman deities for a new set of deities Specifically, the saints, and especially Mary. And over the years, this has not gotten anything but worse. Rome's blasphemous doctrine of Mary knows almost no bounds, and Mary herself must weep her eyes out in heaven over what has been done with her name. Today, the teaching of Rome about Mary contains many different elements. We'll only cover a few of them. They are all reprehensible and apostate to their very core. The Roman church teaches that Mary was born without sin. 
December 8th of 1854. As I said, these things just keep piling up on top of themselves from 380 all the way to today. December 8th of 1854, Pope Pius IX released an encyclical called the Ineffabilis Juice, which reads in part, We declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the most blessed Virgin Mary was preserved from all stain of original sin as a doctrine revealed by God, and therefore is to be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful. No passage of Scripture says anything even remotely close to that. And yet this is the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, that Mary was born without sin. Not only that, but the Roman Church continues to affirm that Mary remained sinless throughout her entire life, and that rather than dying, she was actually just taken up into heaven. The Roman Catechism actually reads it this way. It says, Mary is not only the mother of Christ, but the mother of the church. She was conceived without original sin, and at the end of her life was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things. Does that sound like anyone else that we know? Does that sound like anybody else that we know? Someone who was born sinless, who lived a sinless life, and who was then taken up into heaven as a reigning monarch? That sounds just like Jesus, doesn't it? Functionally, Mary takes Christ's office in the Roman Catholic Church. Not only that, the Roman Church teaches Mary's perpetual virginity. In spite of the overwhelming evidence that Jesus was one of many brothers by Joseph and Mary. Roman Church teaches that one cannot come to Christ without Mary. Pope Leo XIII declared in 1891, the eternal Son of God, when he wished to take the nature of man for the redemption and glorification of mankind, did not do so without first having the absolutely free consent of his chosen mother. Well, if he had to have the consent of his mother who had not been born yet, now we're attributing eternality to Mary, another attribute of God. But he said, he, the Pope Pius said, Jesus did not come until Mary agreed to let him come, who in a sense personified the whole human race. So that, so that, now listen to this, just as no one can attain to the Supreme Father except through the Son, no one can attain to the Son except through the Mother. The Roman Church teaches that it is good and right for faithful Christians to pray to Mary. You, have made, you may have heard of the rosary before. If you have a Catholic background, you probably still remember all the prayers of the rosary, or at least they're somewhat familiar. It's a tool that Catholics use to recite certain prayers. The final prayer of the rosary is the, is the Salve Regina, Hail Holy Queen. Listen to the words of this prayer that are prayed by nearly a billion Catholics every day. Say a prayer. Again, prayer should be going to God, right? But this is a prayer. Save, O Queen, Thou mother of mercy, our life, our delight, and our hope, to thee we exiled sons of Eve lift up our cry. To thee we sigh as we languish in the veil of tears. Be thou our advocate, sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, thou holy mother of God. And you think about the words of Jesus when you pray. Pray in this way. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. The Father, the Godhead, are the only appropriate recipients of prayer. Pope Francis, our current Pope, recently wrote, the Christian who does not feel that the Virgin Mary is his or her mother is an orphan. He also wrote this, he said, Jesus has given us his mother, who joins us on our pilgrimage through this life so that we may never be left alone, especially at times of trouble and uncertainty. Isn't that the job of the Holy Spirit? 
See, the idea that lies behind the Roman church's devotion to Mary and to the other saints as why we don't have near enough time to explore all of the thousands of saints that people pray to for all of the different reasons they might have. But what lies behind it is is this. It's the concept that, that God the Father and God the Son are simply far too removed and and truthfully far too angry to ever be approached by mere mortals. Again, you see the paganism that has just kind of leached its way into the system. And so rather than going directly to the Father or directly to the Son, we would be well advised to go to Mary and the saints. They're more sympathetic. And if we plead our case to Mary and the saints... Well, Mary, Mary is Jesus' mother. He would never deny his mother. I'm not kidding. That is the actual doctrine. That's what they believe. How could Jesus ever say no to his mother? So we'll go to her, and then she'll bring the request to him. Mary and the saints effectively become third parties, interacting with God on behalf of people on earth. They become mediators between God and men. And this is not a peripheral doctrine. In 1544, a young Scottish woman named Helen Sturk was giving birth in the city of Perth to her her last child. Her midwives instructed her that the time had come for her to cry out to the Virgin Mary for help. That was the tradition. That's what you were supposed to do. But Helen had just become convinced about the Protestant Reformation, and she refused. She said, no, I, I, I pray to the Father. I don't have to go to Mary. She was arrested and imprisoned. Shortly thereafter, along with her husband, a man named James, holding her newborn baby in her arms, Helen and James were marched through the streets, James to the gallows. Helen approached him just before they took his life. She kissed him and she said this. She said, husband, be glad. Again, all of this because she refused to cry out to the Virgin Mary. Husband, be glad. For we have lived together many joyful days. In this day in which we must die, we ought to esteem the most joyful of all, because we shall have joy forever. Therefore, I will not bid you good night, for we shall shortly meet in the kingdom of heaven. James was hung before her eyes until dead. Helen was then marched to a nearby pond. She was allowed to hand her newborn to a nearby friend. She was placed in a gunny sack along with stones and weights and then thrown into the water like a bag of garbage all on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church, and all for the crime of blaspheming the Virgin Mary. Finally, the church teaches that Mary shares with Christ in providing salvation as what is called a mediatrix. Catechism says this, it says, By her intercession... By her intercession, she continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. I mean, are you catching this? She, Mary, is the one that brings the gifts of eternal salvation. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church under the title of advocate and helper. Those are the roles of the Holy Spirit. Benefactrix and mediatrix. It is to her protection that the faithful fly in all their dangers and needs. Page 275 of the 1995 edition of the Roman Catholic Catechism. A recent handbook for priests says this, Mary, by her spiritual entering into the sacrifice of her divine Son for men, so Mary made atonement for the sins of men and merited the application of the redemptive grace of Christ. In this manner, she cooperates in the subjective redemption of mankind. Another Catholic devotional book says it like this, Mary is called the gate of heaven because no one can enter that blessed kingdom without passing through her. Friends, there is simply nothing else to say about this other than that it is simply, thoroughly, and utterly blasphemous. It is another gospel. It is a Galatians 1 error. 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There is only one. 
You know, the, the Roman church still has not gotten over the fact that the reformers were willing to speak out so powerfully and so publicly against their blasphemous beliefs. If you were to go to Rome today, and you could do this, you could buy a plane ticket and fly to Rome today, and if you were to go to a specific church in Rome known as the Chisu del Gesù Church in the city of Rome, it's the mother church of the Jesuit order, and this is a picture of it here. If you were to go there today, you would find a chapel within the church known as the Chapel of St. Ignatius of Loyola, and this is a picture of that chapel. And if you were to look on the right side of that chapel, you would find a statue that was commissioned and created by Pietro Le Gros entitled, The Triumph of Faith Over Heresy. And in this, in this statue, what you see is the Virgin Mary here holding a flame and a cross, and two men are underneath her feet with a serpent wound around them, take, dragging them into hell. And you also have a little cherub here pulling pages out of their books, the books that these men wrote. Now, you can't see it normally because of the distance between yourself and the statue, but if you were to come in there with a telephoto lens... And you'd be able to zero in on their faces and realize that this is Martin Luther. And the second man is John Calvin. And I don't know if there could be a more tragic commentary on the Roman church. You see that the Reformation was a call to the church to, to return. It wasn't the beginning of something new, it was a call back to something old, a call to return, a call to repent, a call to reform, and to come back to the fundamentals of the gospel, to leave behind her idolatry, and to come back to Christ and Christ alone. But tragically, Rome refused to heed the voices of the reformers, and she steadfastly refuses to listen to reformers today, even 500 years later, as she continues to cling to her idolatrous worship of the Pope, of the saints, and Mary. We stand in lockstep opposition, Protestant offer, uh, opposition, Protestant protesting, we stand in lockstep with a long line of godly men and women who have gone before us, too many of them who have given their lives for these things, as we have done for some 500 years, declaring that the Pope cannot save you. The saints cannot save you. Mary cannot save you. Only Christ can save you. Solus Christus, Christ and Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, what a beautiful, glorious inheritance we have as evangelical Christians. Really, just as Bible-believing Christians, your word is so explicitly clear that it is Christ and only Christ that saves us. And in our salvation, what we receive is not just an abstract concept of somehow being saved, but we actually receive Christ. And we are beckoned to feed upon Christ and rejoice in Christ and experience union with Christ. Father, we pray. For all those who are lost in a system that would deny them Christ, that would teach that little by little we get a little bit of grace at a time, and maybe if you're lucky, you won't go straight to hell, but you can go to purgatory and be burned for an indefinite amount of time, and then finally someday maybe get to heaven. Oh, Father, won't you release them? Won't you release them? Bring them home. Bring them into the treasure of the gospel. And Lord, would you use us 
and gracious and meaningful conversations to open up the beauty of the gospel, of the reform of what was discovered so long ago, what was rediscovered so long ago, and what we continue to rejoice and celebrate some 500 years later. And it is in Christ and only in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.